Hello, and welcome to Endor Model Railway. I'm Jonathan. Having laid the first loop of track for Endor, which I talked about in my last video, I decided the next step would be to plan how to do the sidings. I knew from my experiments with my pannier tank locomotive that I needed to use electrofrog points, and I needed to find a way, therefore, to power the frogs. I decided I'd be quite happy to change the points by hand, and so I thought an automatic polarity changer would do the trick. An automatic polarity changer, which is called an autofrog or a frog juicer, detects a short circuit in the frog and very quickly changes its polarity. Apparently quickly enough that it's not a problem for the locomotive and that your base station doesn't detect a short circuit and cut the power. Here's a demonstration of a locomotive going back and forth over a unifrog point connected to a gauge master autofrog. To start with, I bought one gauge master autofrog and I tested it. I can't remember with which locos, but I think with the pannier loco, and it seemed to work fine. So I proceeded to buy enough for all of the points that I planned to have. However, over time, it became apparent that the pannier tank wasn't working very well over the autofrog controlled points. At this time, I only had one set of points in the loop on Endor and had the autofrog connected to it using crocodile clips. But the pannier tank was consistently the only locomotive that had any real trouble going over the points. Once again, it was proving to be the pickle in my locomotive fleet. So I decided I basically had no choice and that I would have to use point motors. After watching various videos on YouTube, I decided that there were basically two options. One was to use solenoid point motors, and the other was to use servo motors. I ruled out tortoise-style point motors because they look very bulky, and they're also very expensive compared to the other options. I also had to factor in my decision to keep all of the components for Endor above board. The tortoise point motors would just take up far too much space for that. I decided against the servo motors because it looked like I'd need to learn even more in order to get those working. They'd need some sort of control station to initialize them and calibrate them, and I didn't want to have to be dealing with that. So that just left me with solenoid point motors as the option. I bought a gauge master seat point motor with built-in switch. These need a burst of 12 to 25 volt AC or DC current in order to switch. I had an old Hornby controller that had a 16 volt output, so I was able to test the motor before buying a suitable wall socket adapter. Once I'd finished testing, I bought a gauge master 16 volt AC wall socket adapter to provide power to the point motors. The switching wasn't all that reliable, but gauge master do recommend using a capacitor discharge unit, and they also make one of those. So I bought one of those, and then using that as the power source, the motor started to work well. I didn't find the wiring information that came with the capacitor discharge unit particularly straightforward to follow. It wasn't entirely clear to me which were the two inputs and which were the two outputs but I took a best guess and it worked out. So I'll show a picture here about which way around I've got it working. Having sorted out the wiring and the power and establishing that the point motor does work, I then decided I would actually need a switch to control it. So I bought one of the Pico point switch levers. An important thing to note about these switches is that they're momentary contact. So when the switch is all the way over in one position, it's not actually connecting anything. But as it's on its way from one position to another, it forms a temporary connection. That temporary connection is what gives the burst of power to the point motor. To start with, I was quite happy with these little levers. They do look like nice little signal box levers, but using them is a bit weird. Because the connection is made when the lever is part way through its motion, you get that audio and visible feedback that something has happened, and it sort of feels natural to let go of the lever at that point, but that leaves it in the wrong position you have to be quite determined that you're going to be pushing the lever all of the way. My next challenge was going to be how to actually mount the point motors onto the board and physically connect them to the points. I knew I wanted to do it all above board, but I didn't really know how I was going to make the connection. Something I was sure about is that whatever I came up with, I wouldn't be accurate enough with my model making work or woodworking or any kind of physical working to align things accurately. So I needed something that would allow me to have a bit of play in where I put things and be able to make minor adjustments afterwards. I had to look at what pushrod systems I could find. There are some around, but they looked like they'd be very fiddly and they were quite expensive as well. So I decided I'd need to keep it simpler than that. In the end, I decided to experiment with piano wire. It does seem to be a common choice for switching points, albeit from directly from point motors mounted underneath. But there seems to be a fair bit of rigidity in the wire. To my pleasant surprise, it was rigid enough to push the points even with the spring still in the points. I then found some brass tube to feed the piano wire through. My thinking here is that it would protect the wire from any scenery going above to stop it sticking to the wire, 
and it would help provide that extra bit of rigidity. To connect the piano wire to the points tie bar, I just turned it 90 degrees at the end with a pair of pliers. The challenging part was still left though, I had to connect the piano wire to the point motor rod. I wanted something that would take up a small amount of space and that I'd also be able to adjust after putting in place, particularly in terms of exactly where the piano wire joins it. I thought about this for a while and did all kinds of searches for little bits and pieces that could be used, not really knowing the right kinds of search terms to use. What I've ended up using is small terminal block connectors. This is not what the terminal blocks are designed for, but they are ideal. I can slide the piano wire in as far as I want and then tighten the screws to hold that in place. Most of the block is made of a soft plastic and I can drill a small hole through that to put the point motor rod through. The piano wire needs to be a few millimetres above the level of the board in order to go into the terminal blocks, so I had to bend a small kink into each one, but that wasn't too hard to do. It's worth noting that the rod from the point motor is very tough and you need heavy duty cutters to cut through it. Fortunately, I had a pair of pliers that were good enough. Having installed one point motor and successfully attached it to a point, I could see how much space would be needed for the rest of the point motors to attach to the rest of the points and I could plan properly for where all of the wires were going to go and exactly how far each point motor would need to be away from the points. But work on Endor is very sporadic. I do a little bit every now and again and sometimes don't do anything from weeks on end, which unfortunately gives me a lot of thinking time in between to come up with new ideas for what I want to do with the layout. Endor is supposed to be my just get something done railway, but it's not just for me. I have two little children who like to play, and I like that they like playing with the railway, so I want it to be accessible for them as well. I was a bit worried that they might not be able to relate point switches to actual points, and being able to work out how to set a route for a locomotive to go into the sidings. It's not the end of the world, because I can always do it for them, but they do like to interact with the railway. In all my wisdom, I decided it would be a great idea if I had an LED at the start of each siding, the idea being that a sequence of point switches would light up a sequence of LEDs showing which route was set. This is actually fairly normal for model railways because it's what a lot of people would have in some sort of display panel. I would just be embedding that into the track. The main implication of this decision in terms of electrics and wiring is that each point motor would now be responsible for switching two things. As before, it would need to switch the polarity of the point frog, but now also the LED circuit. The component to achieve that is a relay. I bought a double pole, double throw, miniature relay and did some experiments. The experiments were successful, so I knew what equipment I needed. Now I needed a full plan. Besides what needed connecting to what, there were various things to consider about the circuits. Besides the track, there were three other things to power. The point motors, the LEDs and the relays. For each individual component, the logic for the wiring and the power isn't very complicated. But when they're all put together, it results in quite a complicated overall plan. And I'd realised this and decided that this is why I really needed to get everything down on paper before I could actually proceed. Here's a sneak peek at the eventual diagram I came up with. One of the most important things for me about this diagram is that everything on it is drawn to scale. I spent a long time moving things around and adjusting them so that they would physically fit. I think if I had tried to get on with this without planning first, I would have ended up running out of space on the door. In another video soon, I'll go through this electrics plan in detail and explain all of the calculations that I'd made. In the meantime, I'd be interested to know how other people have approached above board point control. So if you have any comments, please do leave them in the comment section. That's all for now. Bye bye.